We're going to turn our attention across the Atlantic Ocean and we're going to talk about Brexit. Parliament in the UK returning today for a third consecutive day of Brexit voting. Lawmakers assume there will be support to seek a delay. Joining us in London is Yahoo Finance's Oscar Williams Groot with more details for us. It gets confusing for us here in the States because there are so many votes. What's up now? Hi, Adam. Yes. Well, as you said, that's the third day of what are pr all pretty crucial votes. Last night, MPs voted to rule out a no deal Brexit. So they're basically saying they will only leave the EU if we have some sort of deal on the table tonight. The vote will be whether to delay the Brexit timetable. The deadline is, of course, March 29th. That is rapidly approaching. And if we're going to have a deal, then we probably need more time. So this motion would suspend the timeline or ask the EU to give us until the end of June to negotiate a deal. Now, the EU, for its part, Donald Tusk, the head of the European Council, he said that he would be open to potentially a long extension. He said that on Twitter. And some people are talking that it could be delayed by as much as two years, which I, I don't know about you. I'm not sure I can handle another two years of this, but there we go. And the, re the reaction to all of this has been the pound yesterday leapt as much as 2% against the dollar in response to s these signs of a softer Brexit. But as you said at the top there, we're still no closer to really getting to a consensus, getting to a deal. All that we are closer towards is ruling out a no-deal Brexit. And j just quickly, Oscar, even though the UK Parliament says we don't want a no-deal Brexit, does that actually mean it's not going to happen? In other words, if the deadline comes and they haven't come to a deal, doesn't a no-deal Brexit happen anyway? Exactly. You're exactly right. These, these are non-binding votes that are uh, indicative of what the House feels, basically trying to guide the Prime Minister to, to in some way rule it out. But ultimately, as you say, if we reach March 29th and the EU hasn't agreed to give us an extension, then we could very well crash out. There is something we can do unilaterally, which is withdraw Article 50. That's the mechanism that kicked off this Brexit process in the beginning. That, the, the EU has ruled, or sorry, the ECJ has ruled that that can be withdrawn. But I'm not sure there's the political appetite to do that, given that it would anger hard Brexiteers who would see it as possibly a sign that Brexit was trying to be reversed. So I think the most likely outcome from here is that the UK will ask the EU for an extension and we'll have to see if that's granted. Well, we've had a lot of time already and extensions haven't done much, but uh, here's hoping. Oscar, thank you so much. Our next <laughs> guest believes that if there is a no-deal Brexit, it would be uniformly problematic for all sectors, especially in the auto and defense industries. Joining us now, Cornell Capital partner Ann Barry. Ann, thank you for coming in. Um, so Oscar paints a pretty grim picture here of the various eventualities. Uh, first of all, do you think a no-deal Brexit is going to happen, or do you think that we will get that extension? I don't think it will happen. I think there were two votes yesterday that very clearly showed there's no desire to have a no-deal Brexit. The stakes are far too high. But I think even if the extension comes, it's totally unclear what lies beyond that. And I think even a Brexit with a deal that has got the wrong parameters bodes fairly ill for the British economy. So what, what do investors, what do business people who have to make decisions do in this kind of environment? I realize we're all guessing, <laughs> but what? Well, I, I think what you're seeing people do is very little. I think you've just seen stasis. If you look at capital spending in the British economy for the last year, it's ground to a complete halt. It's been down quarter over quarter. If you talk to CEOs, there's some stockpiling and inventory. They're bracing themselves for the worst. But people are sitting there. I think they're trying to wait this out. There's been some contingency plans, some movements in certain sectors back to mainland Europe. But people are just holding their breaths and waiting and seeing and praying a little, I think. So what is the next focus in terms of Brexit? I mean, it seemed like there were the last minute provisions that were made between the UK and the EU, specifically with the border mm. uh, between Northern Ireland and Ireland. Uh, what is that going to be the big focal point to try to get the next step? Or is that kind of just gone by the wayside? I think it's absolutely the pivotal point here. If you think about this sort of the Irish border issue, what it's basically saying is Europe's saying we need a mechanism to make sure that, that no hard border ever goes back in place on this contentious issue. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a mechanism that's legally binding that means that the UK could ultimately leave the EU in the way it wants to. So you've got the Brexiteers saying, this doesn't make sense. We want our sovereignty back. We'll never get it under this construct. So I think as long as that issue exists and remains unresolved, either a no-deal Brexit or a Brexit that's deeply intimidating as outcome will continue to exist. It's really interesting. We talked to an investor yesterday who was with us who said, maybe Brexit will turn out like Y2K. There's all of this <laughs> sound and fury about it. And in the end, 
even if they crash out, you can't not trade with the EU so that it'll sort of muddle along and be fine. I, I think it'll, muddling along is exactly the right expression. There's been plenty of muddling so far. I think, yes, you can't not trade with the EU. The EU is 40% plus of the, of the export market for the UK. But the question is, what does the transition look like and what does that mean for the long run? The, the Bank of England came out and unequivocally said, recession worse than during the financial crisis if there's a no-deal crash out. Well, it's because they have to negotiate. The, the UK has to negotiate how many different treaties with European partners to get car parts that might be put, you know, by Honda in, in the UK. I mean, it seems like a nightmare. But is the, is the game plan, when we heard um, Oscar say maybe a two-year delay, mm. is the game plan to see if public opinion in the UK would turn against Brexit and maybe a new referendum or just, we were just joking, it's all off, let's just go back <laughs> to where we were. I'm serious when I ask that, though. Yeah. Um, well, I think there is, there is definitely going to be general election. If there is a two-year delay, I think there's no question another election happens in the period before that final, final, though we've had many of those exit deadlines. Lines. Um, but the Labour Party, interestingly, um, have, has sort of equivocated a bit. First, they were pro a second referendum. Now they're very quiet on the second referendum front. And so, from a business perspective, I don't think I don't think you can make any assumption that's going to fall one way or the other. And I think you'll continue to see this underinvestment. I think you're going to continue to see some panic, not just around tariffs, but also the regulatory framework is something people don't talk about quite as much. What does it mean, even if there's no tariffs, but you don't have the same standards for products? as your major export partners. So I think there's going to continue to be total confusion. And, you know, when Brexit was first voted upon, there was a lot of concern about what it would mean externally mm -hmm. to the UK, right? That really seems to have faded, should it? By externally, you mean uh, what it you means mean for, for the US, for the EU? Yeah. Well, it's actually funny. So um, President Trump tweeted out this morning, looking forward to you know, negotiating yeah. a stellar deal with the UK. <laughs> Has he been paying attention? <laughs> and it's, it's very interesting because, I mean, look, the President Trump's in a different situation. He, he needs a trade win given what's going on in China, which is a separate issue. But I think um, that the UK is going to be in a somewhat precarious position. It's the fifth largest by GDP nation in the world. Um, so it has some position of leverage to be able to go out and, and try and forge its own strong trading relationships. But when its biggest trading partner continues to be right there and 50% of its, of its trading um, flows, uh, what happens beyond that really is not going to move the needle on a piece by piece basis. It can't compensate for the sheer scale of what's sitting right, right across. Right. And thank you for coming in, giving us your perspective. I hope you come back. Uh, Ann Barry is a partner at Cornell Capital. Thank you so much.